So, ever wanted to make some 2D grid-based movement in one of your Godot games? Maybe because it's a top-down level with a click-to-move system, and you want your character to automatically avoid walls and other obstacles? Then you need to learn about the A-Star Grid 2D built-in. Now, just before we dive in, quick note about Lightem. Lightem is an idle incremental game about stars and constellations I released uh, two months ago, and for Christmas there will be both a 20% discount, bringing its price to less than 4 bucks, and a special update with 10 unique Christmas-related constellations, along with stories behind each one. So if you're curious about the legends behind snowmen, stockings, Santa's reindeers, and more, be sure to have a look at the Steam page, wishlist the game, and if you've tried the item and you've enjoyed it, please leave a review. It's the best way to make the game known to the algorithm and to support the project. A big thanks to everyone who's already gotten, reviewed, or wishlisted the game. And on that note, back to the video. Okay, so let's say that we've got a basic 2D top-down scene like this one. As you can see, the world is made of several tile map layer nodes that define the base level area, the exterior assets, and finally the interior assets that our character will be able to walk on and that will contain some walls that will be our obstacles. Now to actually mark those cells as obstacles, what I did is I went to the tileset resource used by the tile map, and I defined a custom data field of boolean type called obstacle. Now, of course, there are a bunch of available viable types in case you want to store some other kind of info in your tile map, but for now, this is all we need. Once we've defined the data field, we need to tell Godot what its value is for the various cells of our tileset. So let's go to the tileset panel at the bottom of the editor, then to the paint section, and pick the new custom data field from the dropdown. On the left, you can check what value you want to assign to your cells, and then just click on them in the tilesheet visualization on the right to set this custom data value for a given cell in the tileset. For example, here I turn the obstacle field to true for the cells with walls or corners, plus some obstacles and the transparent background equivalent. So in the end, we have a simple tile map based top-down 2D level that we can compute paths on thanks to an A-star grid 2D, and to actually begin doing this, we'll put a script on our root node that exports a reference to the walkable tile map, since we'll need it to analyze it to define our A-star grid, and so here that's our interior tile map layer. Okay, and now the script looks like this. First, as we said before, we export the tile map layer ref, and so that's what we assigned in the inspector. Then we've just got our A star grid to the variable, and it's initialized in the ready function. And as you can see, the really cool thing with the A star grid to the built in is that it's super simple to use. Contrary to the A star 2D or 3D utilities that require you to manually define all the points and connections in your network, here you just need to tell Godot what 2D region to work in, for example, here our viewport size, what the size of one cell is. By default, there will be one by one pixel, but here we'll use the size of a cell in our time map. And finally, just call update, and you're already done with defining a basic path computing graph. But of course, to make it truly consistent with our level, we also need to tell our A star grid which cells are obstacles, otherwise, they will just be considered walkable like any other cell. For that, we can go through our tile map's used cells, check the custom obstacle field, and if that value is true, we'll mark the matching point as solid in our grid, which basically means it's a roadblock and the algorithm won't be able to go through that cell when computing new paths. And so with all that, we've now got a simple A star grid to the instance that matches our viewport size and properly represents our tile map info. That being said, right now, if we run our game, it's pretty hard to know that anything's going on, since we don't visualize or use this grid in any way. To solve this issue, let's see how we can draw a debug heatmap of our grid that highlights the walkable and non-walkable cells. To do this, we're going to use Godot's draw method, which I discussed in this previous tutorial, so take a look if you're curious. Basically, it's a quick and easy way to draw 2D stuff on your screen via code, which makes it very dynamic. So let's say we update our scene and add a basic UI hierarchy like this one on top of our 2D elements with a grid display node at the top 
and then some containers wrapping around a checkbox that will allow us to toggle our heat map on or off at will during runtime. The magic will happen in the script that is on our grid display node, and that looks like this. At the top, we first got a reference to the A star grid to D to visualize. We'll take care of assigning that in a second. For now, just assume that it's already been set for us. Below, we've got our little boolean flag to know if we actually want to display the heat map or not. And it's toggled by this function below that is set as a callback for checkboxes toggle signal in the editor. Finally, whenever we change one of our variables, we call the QRedraw built in that tells Godot to reprocess or override of the draw method where we actually compute the visualization. So after making sure everything's properly initialized and toggled on, what we'll do is go through each cell in our A star grid, so every coordinate in our grid to the region. We can easily know if this cell is workable or not by using the isPointSolid method of our A star grid to the instance, passing in our current coordinates. And so here, I'm using a slightly transparent red color for cells with obstacles, so the ones that are non-workable and I'm using a slightly transparent green color for cells that are workable. The last step is to actually draw the rectangle with a draw built-in method, and so we're going to draw the rectangle with our given color on top of the grid cell, meaning we just need to multiply all of our coordinates by our cell size, and we'll have our heat map. Also, don't forget that we still need to assign our grid instance to this grid display node, which we can do in our main script, the one on the root node, like this. If we try our demo again, and we toggle on our heat map debug, you see that we directly get a green and red overlay that perfectly matches our tile map and the obstacle value of our cells. As a quick note, if you don't want a cell in your A star grid 2D to be completely blocked, but instead just try and discourage the algorithm from going through here, if there's another possible path, even a slightly longer one, then you can play around with your cell's weight instead. Basically, a cell with a high weight is a bit like an obstacle, it will be less interesting to go through for the algorithm, and a cell with a lower weight will be easier to cross, and so it will be favored by the algorithm. Alright, so now that we have an A star grid 2D and that we've checked it matches our tile map, the last step is to actually use this grid to compute some paths. So let's add a new player object in our scene and use it to auto compute the best possible path, according to our 2D grid, towards the cell that we're currently hovering with our mouse. Now, this player node is an instance of a player prefab scene that is a pretty basic hierarchy. The player node itself is a character body 2D, this way if we ever want to add some collisions in our game, it will work directly. Inside, we've got a line 2D node that we'll use to show our player a previs of the A star computed path, and by the way, note that I put it in top level mode so that it ignores the transform of its parent node and it works globally. Then we've got a sprite to the for the visual, and finally we've got a collision shape to the node to define the physical shape of our character body 2D, which here is a simple square. And of course, our player root node has a script that, for now, contains the following. First, we've got our reference to the A star grid to the instance, and a few variables to keep track of where we are currently, where we're going, and what our cell by cell steps will be. These move points will be filled by our A star grid to the path computing algorithm, as we'll see very soon. The setup function is where we'll assign our grid reference, and where we'll use it first to compute our current starting cell based on our global position. You see that we compute it with this post to cell util method that simply divides the 2D position by the grid's cell size to change referentials. Also, we'll say that, by default, our target cell is our current starting cell. Now, all that's left to do is to use the built-in input hook that is called whenever there is a user input to check if our mouse was moved, in which case we should try and recompute a new path to the cell our cursor is now hovering. Of course, if this cell is the same as before, we can abort the computation, since path computation with these tools is deterministic, and so the result will be the same. But if our new target is different, then we'll use our A star grid to the instance's getPointPath method to compute a new optimized path between our current cell and the new target based on our grid and all of its obstacles. 
Then, because our player object is in the middle of a cell, we needed to remember to offset our move points by half the size of our grid cells to get the middle of the cells instead of their top left corner. We can now assign this newly computed set of points to our previous line to visualize it in the scene and update our target cell value. Last but not least, remember to go back to the main script on our demo's root node and assign the A star grid to the reference to our player node by calling its setup function. This can also be a good opportunity to tell Godot that we'll want to do grid-based movements by using the Manhattan distance for path computations, which is the usual way to compute distances and paths when you're using right angles. And there we go! If we run the scene, we see that now, as soon as we move our mouse and hover another cell of the tile map, our A star grid to D recomputes the best path between our player's current position and this target cell, and of course, it takes into account all the obstacles on the way, which means that our line can only go through empty spaces and doors. However, you'll notice that, by default, the system allows for diagonal movements. This can be very cool in some cases, and you can totally keep it if you want, but here this causes a little problem. Because we've got those inner corner tiles that are not marked as obstacles, and it kinda makes sense that they're not, the grid will manage to find a path through this corner, and basically try and teleport us on the other side of the wall. Now, of course, this totally depends on your tileset, and on how you defined your obstacles. Here, since I want to do a straight grid-based movement anyway, I'll just go back to my main script and tell my A star grid to the instance that I do not want to allow for diagonal movements. And now you see that the path my grid computes are made only of straight lines, and I don't have any bugs. To wrap up this tutorial, let's quickly see how to really move our player according to this cell-by-cell grid-based path. I won't go into too much details, cause honestly it's not that riveting. In short, the idea is that when we left-click, we'll start our move, which will initialize a current point index, and toggle on a moving variable to hide our previous and block any new path updates until we're done walking this path. For actually updating our player's position, we'll use the physics process hook, since remember that it's a character body 2D? And so this chunk of logic is basically just a big loop that keeps on going until we've reached the final point in our computed path, and so whenever we get close enough to an intermediary point in our pre-computed path, we just update the current index and start aiming for the next one. Also, since we only do this physics process logic when we're moving, we can toggle the processing of this method so it only runs when we're moving. But in any case, here we are! If we try this again, we see that now, when we move our mouse on the screen, and so across our tile map, the matching A star grid to the instance computes the best path towards this spot, if possible, and taking into account all the walls and obstacles on the way. And so then if we left-click on a cell, our player moves towards it, while sticking only to tiles that are walkable. So there you go! I really hope you liked this quick tip! Don't hesitate to react in the comments, and to subscribe to the channel to get more videos, and of course, a huge thank you to my Patreon members for their support, and to you for watching. And as always, take care.